Welcome to The One Inside, an internal family systems podcast. I'm your host, Tammy Sollenberger. On today's episode, I speak with Mariska Gleison about marriage and stepfamilies. Hey, everyone. So I wrote a 13-point outline in the show notes. This episode is full of ideas to help improve your relationships. I hope it is helpful to you and you can share it with others. I wanted to spend this time before the show to talk about what happened to me personally during it. I didn't know we were going to talk about stepfamilies. I thought we were going to talk about marriage, and it didn't dawn on me that that included stepfamilies. So what happened is pretty soon, pretty early on, I had a part that started screaming at me, I would not have agreed to this. I would not have agreed to this. I did not agree to this. I love this part. She is my avoider and I love her. And she shows up throughout. She even says a loud no to Mariska when Mariska says, hey, let's work with this part. Because what you don't see is that I begin crying and I can't get it together. I can't stop crying. So eventually, you know, Mariska sees that. You don't see it, but she sees it. And so then I finally voice it and we do a little piece of work. This is probably about the 20-ish minute mark. My intention when I agreed to tell Mariska my story was I was pausing from doing the podcast. I'm like, okay, we're pausing from doing that. And I'm going to talk about what's happening for me right now. And I'll just delete it. Um, And I think that's why I was able to say everything that I said and do the work that I did. But we kept referring to it. I also have a part who really, really likes to be helpful. And so Mariska and I have talked about this several times since. And I really got that this might be helpful to somebody. So as I was fighting tears... Um, This part was saying to me, we can't hold this in anymore. And as I told Mariska, I was able to feel calm and clear. So there was this avoider happening. If I was to map this out, there was this avoider that was like, what are we doing? And then this, these tears that were coming that could not stop coming. And it was like, I'm going to have to do something because this isn't, this is, this battle isn't, this is not going to work. Um, and so as I, as I let those, those tears speak, I began to feel calmer and clearer. And, um, and then I was able to be with that part of me. Um, and you'll, you'll hear all of that. And then, um, and feel honestly, I felt fine. I mean, I felt like I had just been crying. Um, but I felt, Uh, I felt really clear-minded. I felt very connected to Mariska. I felt really present for the rest of the the podcast. Um, You can hear my voice that I had just been crying, but but I felt fantastic. And it was so interesting listening to it again because I could feel at the beginning of the episode, as soon as we talk about step families, I could feel myself um, be really, really triggered. And then obviously I hear the work that I do, and then the rest of the episode, I, I feel very present and connected. What I want you to know and how the other way I hope this episode is is helpful to you, not only just with um, maybe hearing my story a little bit um, and the pack full of information that Mariska gives for helping relationships, but what I really want you to also take away is the power of this model because this model is incredibly powerful that I'm able to be triggered by uh, talking about step families. A part of me is triggered. And within five minutes, now I know I've done a lot of work on this part, honestly. Um, and I, I have a strong connection to, to self. Um, but I'm able to be triggered. And within five minutes, my body, my emotions, my thought process – all responds. It all responds to self. It relaxes. I'm able to focus. I'm able to feel present. Those parts of me are no longer triggered. They feel taken care of. And I could finish this episode. And so I want you to to also see that part of it, that, that idea that this model is just such a gift. And I am so grateful for it. I hope everyone's taking care And um, I know there's a lot of hard stuff happening right now, and I just want you to take care of yourselves and remember that you have this self, this beautiful essence, this true 
true sense and essence of who you are that is calm and compassionate and clear-minded and creative and who's with you always and is inside of you and can be with those parts of you who are triggered, those parts of you who are scared, those parts of you that are overwhelmed, those parts of you that are in relationships that are really, really hard and that that true self can be there and is there with you. Enjoy this episode. Hi there. Good morning. Good morning. My condo is being completely redone. So I've been living in a deconstructed zone. No refrigerator, no nothing. The kitchen is completely in a wreck. So it's been about five weeks now. Oh my gosh. Okay. We've been away for three weeks and we're back in the condo and hopefully it'll be ready by the time my son gets married, which is in one week. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Congratulations. That is a lot. Holy cow. Yeah. 10 days. Yeah. Wow. He's going to be married the 19th. So it's very exciting. It's a really small wedding outside what are you what are you gonna wear (laughs) that's the most important thing yes yes just got a dress a beautiful dress oh so it's kind of like a mid-length like to the uh, calves okay and the navy blue and white it's beautiful oh i can't wait to see pictures yeah so that's very exciting. That is exciting. How have you handled, how yeah. have you handled, how has your marriage been with, with the stress of that? With yeah. The, yeah. Sort of like with the, so I'm thinking of, we're talking about marriage today and I'm thinking of marriage during COVID and all the stresses of like people being together <laughs> all the time. And I'm thinking of the stress on a marriage of having your condo not being able to use your your condo, not being able to use your, your um, kitchen. And I know you're such a cook and you're such a foodie. And so I I guess I'm just curious. I don't know how much you want to share, but I'd love to hear how you're coping with all of that craziness. Well, it has been very stressful, you know, trying to see when things were said that they were going to be done And, you know, so there's been a little tension around that. And I think we're getting along better because you know how, like, impermanence is a bitch and COVID has been, like, accentuating that to the nth degree. Like, you can't depend on anything. Everything we've known before has been kind of wiped away. Mm. And so it really brings up, you know, the fleetingness of everything, which causes a lot of people to be more worried, depressed, anxious. But for me, I felt a lot more gratitude, Mm. you know, toward my husband because that impermanence like he could be gone in any minute so I may just I may as well just really appreciate him (laughs) while I have him around and that's not even like because we're old it's because you know yeah we don't know yeah death is all around us now yeah yeah so yeah I I feel much closer to him now now we have been going to our offices because we can't stay in the condo. Right. So, so it's more normalized now, the yeah. marriage, because we haven't been at home together and we both do the same thing. I love that. What you, just, you just said so much good stuff right there. And I just am like, wow, that's so true where it's like, yeah, everything's changing. Everything, everything has changed. Everything's shifting. We still can't even rely on like, things being a somewhat normal I don't know if if I'm feeling this and I feel I feel like in some ways things are kind of a little bit more normal I mean they're not normal but I don't know if we're just getting used to it or what but it's feeling I'm feeling like it's more normal um 
Yeah, because you can go out and eat outside. Yeah. You know, I've yeah. seen our kids a lot more. We had dinner on their porch outside yeah. the table. So it is, you know, people were coming together a little bit more. Yes, I think that's exactly what it is, right? Like, right, I'm doing play dates with my friends in their yards. Like, and that's something I didn't see my friends for months. We were doing Zoom play, not play dates, but we're doing oh. Zoom, you know, get togethers. So you're right. Yeah. But that idea that like my marriage is, could potentially be the one stable ish thing in the midst of all the unstable. Exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is, you know, there's some gratitude, and I'm sorry for all the single people out there that are listening. There's gratitude for having someone to go through it with. Wow, yeah. Because it is awfully hard to be going through COVID by yourself. I know, because I see a lot of young adults, you know, 20s, 30s, who are looking for love and dating during COVID. Mm. And it's challenging, very, very challenging appreciation of having someone. I love that because I feel like we have been married 20, I think it's 25 years this year. And I think that like, I, there's a part, parts of me definitely have lost any appreciation. <laughs> you're, you're just like, you're on my nerves, really. Right. Like, exactly. yeah. Yeah. And so I don't, you know, we got married really young. And so I don't, I don't know what it's like to be in my twenties and be single, but I think it's a good reminder of what I have and being appreciative of that. Even if other parts of me are like, no, but that's that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. (laughs) All parts are welcome, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So I think that not taking things for granted is really up for me, you know, yeah. during this COVID thing. Yeah. And not taking him for granted. So not, so appreciation is really up. Appreciation for him and for having somebody and having a partner and, yes. and not taking any, not taking him for granted or your relationship for granted. Yeah, that's good. Yes. And also in the beginning, so I ha- I see a lot of couples, as you know, And I'm noticing that the people who are introverted are really doing better. Yeah. Yeah. And I have, you know, one couple in particular where, you know, they were a lot feeling a lot closer because, you know, she didn't have to see his children. He's very socially as friends from like childhood And so no one was coming in and it was just them. And that was better for her. Now that, you know, things are resuming again, they're rubbing up against the same difficulties of her feeling, you know, um, unappreciated or that his attention goes elsewhere. And yeah. So did she realize that before this happened? Did she realize that that was um like a trigger for her or that was an issue in their relationship like did she realize that before the covid thing happened yes but she didn't experience him being home all the time right right okay so she felt the difference when with him being home she really could experience the difference and really liked that and then yeah. that kind of highlighted this other thing that was happening that she did not like that's right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You know, where she feels like she doesn't belong, like she's an Aww. outsider. Oh, yeah. With his friends and his children, you know. Mm, yeah. So that's very interesting. That brings up the whole step family thing, which is a completely different issue. But what? How many marriages are having to deal with that? Like, you know, like that's yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I know my mom. Yeah, I grew up in a step family, crazy one of those crazy families. And so, um, yeah, I'm sure that that making it even harder for people, like marriage is hard enough. And it's just like that, that makes it more complicated. Yes. Yes. And then, you know, I hear a lot of stories about evil step parents <laughs> and, you know, they don't treat the stepchildren Aww. the same as their birth children, yeah. you know, 
Yeah. It's just crazy. Yeah. And the step, the wife or the husband that came in kind of influences their parent to kind of just be with them and do whatever they want them to. Yeah. Which impinges on the children, of course. And I've heard children get kicked out from their homes. Um, There's one case I have where he had a 25 year hiatus from his dad who lives in another country. And just when he was getting back to connect with him and the mother, the, the stepmother had died, the father died. So he didn't have a chance. He saw him once and didn't have a chance to rekindle. Mm. I know. Oh, wow. A really, really hard stories with yeah. step families. Very yeah. hard stories. Do you have advice for couples that are in this step family? They're trying to be a couple in the midst of parenting step families. Well, I think that for Tracy and I, my husband, there was some, you know, and sometimes still is some rockiness um, that, you know, I experience with his kids and the more I really work on my own parts, which is what I was going to say for couples, right? I go, I do a U-turn. Yeah. I see what's happening for me and my parts. I have really worked it out so that, you know, I really feel close to his daughter now. Mm. I feel connected to his daughter. And it's amazing. It, it wasn't her, you know, it was me yeah. and his relationship to both of us. It, was, it just became very clear. Wow. Right. That nothing really changed. So this is sort of the thing that's, that's um, unbelievable, but is so true is that nothing can change. And then I'll say this for myself. I know this for a fact, nothing can change in my relationship. Nothing changes. But if I work on my parts, a whole lot can change, whether Mm -hmm. it's with my husband or my mom or my kid or whatever. But yeah, Mariska, would you feel okay sharing a little bit just about your story, about your marital story? Just so, because people probably don't know. Tracy is your second husband and like how long you guys have been married and sort of what your family situation is. Would that feel okay? Yeah, we've been together for 10 years and um, we've been married for almost seven. I have two boys from my first marriage. One's getting married. (laughs) One's 28 and the one that's getting married is 31. Okay. Okay. Yes. And they're very um, handsome, handsome boys. Thank you. Yeah, they I love them. love them very much. So, um, you know, this whole thing with step families where the person who has the kids is a stuck insider and the step parent is the stuck outsider. That's Ooh, the terminology okay. that Patricia Papper now has coined. Okay. Right? The stuck insider and the stuck outsider. Okay. And, you know, I think Tracy has experienced that, and so have I, right? Mm, Yeah. So, you know, it's good when parents can take time with their children alone, too, and then, you know, bring the partner in. But sometimes it's good for one parent to just be with their kids. Yeah, yeah. Without the other one. Yeah. Even as adults, right? Like your kids are adults, but yeah. Right, right. I didn't raise his kids. So that's, you know, that's a difference too. How many kids does he have? Two. Okay. His daughter is in her late 30s and his son is 32. Right. So that's different too about like if you're in a step family and you're raising the kids, then that would have some different dynamics. But the same advice, I'm putting that in quotes, is that work on your own parts. I didn't realize how I avoid talking about the step family thing altogether because I think parts of me and now I'm going to cry. Okay. So there's some parts of me, I think that have were really hurt by my, 
the step family situation. So I just don't, I don't talk about it. I love working with teenagers and like um, teenagers that are in the middle of it because I so identify, I have parts that really identify with those teenagers that are in the middle of the step family thing. Yeah, so that was just what's coming up for me that was a little bit shocking. I was like, whoa, where's this coming from? Mm. Yeah. So you don't talk about your feelings about being feeling sus, like a stuck insider or a stuck outsider and you don't really know a lot about it and you're just avoiding it. Yes. And there's a lot of, because there, I can see that there's a lot of intense feelings. Yeah. And so that's what we do, you know, when there's like deep vulnerability, we just do anything to distract from it, right? Because yeah. we don't want to feel that pain. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I have great avoider parts. I love them. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I also think that like when I talk to these, to my clients, you know, it's so important for their birth parents if the children are willing to talk, and we're talking about adult children now, to try to listen to them as best they can, right? Mm -hmm. And it's hard because some of them are so angry and feel so ripped off oh. and even duped. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of avoidance that, that adult children have toward their parents even now because of the way they were treated you know, or they weren't protected by the mother. Yeah. When they had an abusive stepfather, you know, all this stuff, it's just, it's just endless. Yes. And I think that, right. So it's not just that, uh, the little, the little kids in the step family situation, it's as, as you get older, right? Like even your kids or your husband's kids, they might still have a lot of feelings about, about it. Right. So what's your situation, if I can ask, Tammy? <laughs> I know, like, good heavens, I'm being triggered so much. Oh. Um, I know this is, and I'm like, sh I'm like surprised. I like, but I think that's what, what it is, is like, I don't talk about it. And I'm like, we're supposed to be talking about marriage. We're not supposed to be talking about this. <laughs> I'm just curious. Yeah, I think I'll tell you later, because I don't think I can, I'm, ha I'm having like a hard time. Yeah. I'm sorry. No problem. Do you want me to work with you a little bit and we can do this? <laughs> no, no. Yeah, this is like coming up from the, out of the blue. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't even know what this is. Like, it feels like, oh my gosh. Another part of me is like, get it together. What is happening? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so don't be sorry. You know, maybe you just want to take a moment. Okay. I'm just be with this part that's like really being triggered and see what it needs from you. I think that, um, okay, so what I'm hearing is that, um, so I think you have like marriage in this step family situation. And I think for this part of me, there's been always so much focus on how hard it was for my mom. You know, so my story is like my mom had me when she was a teenager. My mom and dad were both teenagers and they got married and um, they got divorced when I was like one. And then it was just me and my mom until I was about nine. And then she met my stepdad. Uh, my stepdad's great. And, um, and then he had two kids and one of his kids came and lived with us. Um, so it was me, my stepdad my mom and then his daughter who was a year older than me but she was in the same grade as me and then they had a, a daughter um so i have a sister so the person that i say is my sister is my sister that's 10 years younger than me and we actually had kids at the same time so we have my son and her daughter um are the same age so that really helped us get closer mm -hmm. um and then my dad my um, biological dad like we stayed in touch and he married my stepmom when I was like I don't know five or something really and she's awesome and um, I have three brothers and um, yeah so I mean my mom and dad are you know they don't get along never did never will um, but everyone else is, is lovely so I think what was coming up for me is um, 
there's part of me that's never really been, and, and this isn't true because I've done a lot of work. It was the first thing I did with IFS is work on this loss, the sense of loss, like loss of my mom. That was like the first thing I did when I was in Cape Cod with Dick, like before I had done like level one um, that I didn't know was there was this like huge loss. I think what was happening when I was, I got so triggered by talking about marriage because there's a part of me that was like was feeling all the feelings of the kids sort of this like broad feeling like what it feels like as a kid when like the marriage and its step family is like so important and then as a kid you just get like lost right yep and so I was like, I want to keep talking about marriage and how that it's hard for a step family. But this part of me is like, it's really hard for me to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just really being in touch with this part that got lost or that felt lost. Is that what's going on? Yeah. 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 And it's like, I haven't worked with these parts in so long. Like, right. um, all my work at the beginning was on these parts and I would go to therapy and I would just sob and sob and sob. And so, yeah, I'm just reminding her. Yeah. I'm kind of seeing, I remember I have this like 13 year old that's like hanging out on my couch in my house now. And I'm seeing a couple other ones that I worked with like a long time ago. Mm -hmm. yeah that feels better I can just remind them that I'm here and yeah they haven't they haven't needed me for a while I guess or yeah, yeah. right and just really you know thanking them for you know coming out and you know if they can just let you be with me and you'll be back to them. Yeah. You know, when you're, when you have time. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Thank you. That was great. Yeah. But I think this is really good, Tammy, because it's so true. I mean, Anybody listening to this that experienced this, I mean, even yesterday I was with a client and um, she had an abusive stepdad and she said, and I was so sad, you know, um, she said, I just wanted him to love me. Aww. Yeah. Yeah. And then that, you know, that lack of protection, you know, that failed protector um, that her mother was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's so, that's so hard because um, I just feel like it's so complicated because I feel like even in my situation, like my husband, like my current situation with my, my husband, um, I know there's been times and not that my husband is abusive at all, but I know there are times that like um, he's on my son about something and not even like yelling or like hitting or anything like that. And I might disagree but like the rule about like, you're not supposed to kind of disagree or, and I baby my son, <laughs> which probably everybody knows. And so I want to like pick him up and, you know, cradle him. And um, so it's so hard because I think there are times that I feel like I should step in and protect my son, even though that doesn't need to happen but there's a part of me that wants to do that. Um, but then I don't because it, it's like, as is a, is a marriage it's like I don't think you're supposed to do that I, th I don't know so it's, so I think that even in like even in an easy situation I think that's hard to do yes and especially you know with a new marriage or a second marriage um I don't know maybe there's more of an awareness of wanting to get along with the second spouse more oh, and so yeah Right. And get 
the children can get in the way and yeah yeah well that's a good point way more commonly oh right the idea that it's a second marriage so you want to even get along even more or like oh well i've got to work on this even more and so then that's the kids are going to become so secondary because yeah yeah that makes sense which i just which i just occurred to me just now yeah right Yeah. yeah yeah i think that makes a lot of sense yes and then you know you have the history of the first marriage that is bringing that is being brought to the second marriage right oh yeah, so there, there yeah. that complication too yeah yeah do you want to talk you about know, that a little bit you know all the unmetabolized feelings or parts that went on in the first marriage kind of get brought into the second marriage and there might there might be guilt towards the way that you parented your children or there may be guilt about leaving the first spouse or and that gets visited onto the second marriage oh right okay okay right. yeah right. so so the guilt that you know for example my husband may feel you know about you know being married to an alcoholic the first time around his kids you know could be one of the reasons why he can't stand up for me more yeah right? yes that. yeah that's good okay so i'm just going to say that again so like the part of him that feels guilty that he didn't that his wife was an alcoholic and so his first wife was an alcoholic and so there's things that didn't happen in the marriage or with the kids then that part is then going to like overcompensate to protect the kids okay and then then that's going to then come up against your part that has its own feelings for maybe you know your husband wasn't attentive or something right so then yeah, so then those parts are even, it's almost like even more vulnerable parts, <laughs> more complicated. Yeah. But he can't hear my side of it or, you know, because he so wants us to get along, right? Yeah. But he doesn't want to push his children away and he's in a conflicted loyalty between me and the kids, so... Yeah. There's that. Yeah. Mm. Conflicted loyalty. Yeah. Talk about conflicted loyalty. That's beautiful. Mm. Yeah. So you want, so you're stuck in the middle of your kids and your new wife. And you want to please both of them, but you don't really know how. Mm. And you've got loyalties toward, it's just like an irregular um, marriage when you know you've got your mom and your dad and you know you may have conflicted loyalty between both of them or one will say something bad about the other and then that will come up yeah yeah conflicted loyalty probably it comes up all the time right like whether it's mm-hmm. with your wife and your mother-in-law or your mother right your wife and your mother or your dad and your husband or uh, That's yeah right. yeah yeah mm. and wanting to please both and it's almost an impossible situation yeah just to kind of know that is really helpful well right? and you know what's yeah what's landing on me is the idea that i have a desire or like say my husband has a desire to please um but he doesn't know how that gives me a lot of empathy because i always joke about like like genders like the idea that like men and women like we have no idea like we, i've not been with my husband forever and there's plenty of times that I'm like, he was thinking that? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, I don't, that doesn't make any, it makes no sense to me. So that kind of leads me into another point that I wanted to make, which is, you know how like when you're at the same dinner table and you're with your partner, you're with your husband, and you hear certain things and talk about it afterwards 
and your husband hears something completely different and it's crazy making because yes. you don't even you know they say no she didn't she said that or no he right and yes. so so i'm reminded of this like phrase you know when and and couples fight about what went on between them all the time because what's most important is for them to be right yeah. and for their partner to see that they're right and so often i say well do you want to be right or do you want to experience love and closeness with one another because both of them don't go hand in hand you can be right or you can feel closeness what do you want but it's so hard for people to let go of being right. No, no, that's not what happened. No, that's not right. And it's like a ping pong ball. <laughs> and right. Fight, and all you're doing is fighting. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then, right, so how many times, as you're saying that, I'm like, right, how many times have either my husband and I or I've heard in my office people arguing over, like, right, like, what happened? At the, and I'm like, this doesn't matter. Like, I don't, I don't care if she said spaghetti and you think she said mushrooms. Like, and then they'll argue about that. And you're like, this doesn't, doesn't matter at all. But you're right. But what matters in, to a part of them is that they're right. And so then they're arguing about whether they're right or not. So then it sounds like there's arguing about something so stupid. But what they're actually arguing about is whether they're right. Whether they're right, whether they're good, yeah, like good right. people. And, and when they fight with their partners or they have this insecurity that they brought with them to the relationship, they have to prove that they're good and they're right. Mm. And that doesn't make sense. This makes and so much valued. sense. Valued. Oh, and valued. Okay. And so if in a second marriage, that would be even harder or that those like wanting to be right, wanting to be valued and wanting to be, what was the other thing that you said? right? Value good. and good. good. Yeah. Good. That that would good be. Yeah. Yes. yeah. 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 Well, you know, it may not be different in a second marriage. I think these issues go to every relationship. Yeah. They're happening all the time. Wanting to be right, wanting to be, feel good and valued. And, you know, when their partner feels, when their partner criticizes them or gives them feedback, there are these inherent, you know, exiles that feel insecure and not good enough. Mm. So they're triggered by that a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's true. By feedback or criticism. Right? Yeah, right, right. So they that's could... what they're really fighting about. Right, right. So how do you um, get them to switch? <laughs> switch that thought process that is um like if i'm fighting about um something that happened at this dinner party and how do i switch that to wait a minute do i want to be close or do i want to be right like how do i make that switch so if you're both triggered it's hard right yeah well so, you know in couples therapy you know you just have to slow it down and really try to see what parts are up so they can see it and um, get them to unblend. The anger is all consuming. They're all anger. There is no separation between the anger or the sadness or the frustration or, you know, the blocking out or the withdrawing. There's no separation. So you've got to get that part to be separate like we did today with you yeah 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 so when the when you're so blended and so then when they're arguing about this thing happening at the dinner party then it's sort of pause it's sort of slowing it down and having them both do a u-turn about what's happening inside of them and so right. they they can then separate from some of those parts that are like mm -hmm. You know, she always thinks she's right, blah, 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 whatever, whatever is happening. Right. The always and never is a telltale <laughs> sign that there's blending going on. Yeah, right. right. And I often say to them, not always and never, often or sometimes, 
Mm. And that helps, you know, wording helps, right? Yeah, yeah. I must think that wording probably softens parts, right? Sort of if, if I'm in a, you always, blah, 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 blah. And then I'm like, hey, wait a minute. You sometimes, I actually feel like the anger part softens. And then, then there's a chance for more space and more unblending can happen. Right, right. So rather than being like authoritative, I sometimes say, you know, um, I learned this from a teacher way back when, like, in my opinion, so in my opinion, and that can soften things too, or from my vantage point, Ooh. right? I, like I that. Yeah, so it softens things. Yeah. Rather than this self-righteous indignation that can happen very quickly in couples. Yeah. Because then, then you can say, I may or may not be right, but this is my opinion, right? So there's some flexibility there. Yeah, I think that we, I don't know if this is true for you, but I feel like I, I learned probably all did, learned that I have to be, I have to have this self-righteous energy in order to be, to tell you that I'm right. Like to, right. So, so if I don't have that much intensity about it, then, then that it almost like, I'm not bringing that much intensity to the fight to be right. Then that could soften it too. Right. Cause the more, so I think there's a part, probably a protector part that learned somewhere that like you have to be louder <laughs> and believe you're completely right. Like even more so when you're trying to like prove yourself right and good and valuable. But I think the fear of that part, probably one of them is that, you know, they're afraid they'll become a doormat or completely manipulated by the other person or, and that's dangerous. So that self-righteous indignation keeps that from happening and gives you this false sense of security that you're not a doormat, you know, that you're right, that you have autonomy. Yes. I love that because that's such a great way of explaining the model too, right? That like this protector that's all loud and tough is actually really protecting. For me, as you said that, I thought, yeah, the part that plays small, that's like, yep, honey, whatever you think, yep, it's, she said spaghetti or, you know, whatever it is, it's almost like this part that feels um, like she doesn't have a voice. So I have a, definitely have a part that feels like she doesn't have a voice. And then this part is probably really protecting me from that energy of that other part, that little XL. Yeah, it was, it's very enlightening about the step family stuff because I've done so much work mm. on it internally and with people, with, with my patients, with my clients. It's been, you know, one after another. So yeah. I'm sure that people will resonate, you know, with you and this tender part because I was thinking, you know, I think that's, probably some of it, which is that, you know, the child feels like they lost their parent to the partner. Yeah. And that's infuriating and sad and lonely and like a shock. Yeah. Well, and what you and I were texting, um, what we had to take a little bit of a break, but we were texting and I, and I said to you, I, I didn't even know that was there. So, you know, my mom, they got married when I was 10. And so probably, I was probably in my th late 30s, maybe just 40, when I had this experience with IFS. And I did not even know, I didn't even know that I felt that way, but what, that I had a part that felt that way. And um, yeah, there was a lot there that I didn't even know because um, I have such good, you know, I have good pretending parts. I'm like, I have good pretending parts that eat all the cookies. And I'm like, I'm fine. I've just eaten a hundred cookies, but I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. I have that. So I think, yeah, I think that, um, yeah. 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 And it makes me, it makes me feel better um, knowing that that could be helpful to people because I'm like, I'm cutting all of that out. But then I'm like, well, if it's helpful, then I'll keep it in. <laughs> So there was one um, thing that I wanted to talk about with couples, which is that our partners often ask us to stretch, right? 
And usually when they ask you to do something, it's the hardest thing that you can do. Like it's hard for you to do. And when you do it, it feels, you feel like a better person for it. So for example, you know, like me being compassionate towards Tracy's children is something that I needed to do for myself, not just for him. And so even though it was hard at times, because I felt very, I don't know, things were unfair or falsely accused or whatever, I feel so much better about me. Wow. I love that. Right. So that, you, so that I think there are parts of me that are like, I don't want to do what my husband's asking me to do because he's asking me to do it and I can't, don't tell me what to do. So that's right. That rebellious part. <laughs> yeah. Or I'm not feel controlled. I don't want to feel controlled. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but a lot of times when our partners are asking us to stretch in a certain way, it's probably exactly what we need to do for ourselves. Wow. And that's, that almost feels like a game changer a little bit. And what a different way of thinking of it. Like if my, my husband is asking me to do something that stretches me, that that's actually really good for me and good for my parts and, and a good, um, like a growing edge or something that will help grow me. Yes. Yes. Right. I love that. Well, and you're saying too, with your experience, you actually feel better. You're like, we have a better relationship and I feel better. And Oh yeah. Cause who wants to hold hatred is a strong word, but you know, who wants to hold negativity inside them about anyone? Yeah. yeah. We don't want to do that. Right. Right. And that's another point. My other point is, when our partners are like really triggered, you know, like when they're being an asshole and being mad or shutting us out or icing us out or, you know, whatever is the part that you can't stand, just think they are not doing this on purpose. There's pain. So if a person's triggered, there's pain. And if you can just realize that, you know, that my partner is in pain, like sometimes I'll be so frustrated and I'll just be flailing around. And when my husband realizes I'm in pain and he's compassionate, it can help. So I have parts that I think are jerks, love them. But so what came up for me was when there's a part of me that's like, if I could see my husband, if he's, um, if he's being a jerk <laughs> and, and if I could see, oh, that's just his pain, right? The jerk is the protector, right? And there's this pain behind it. Immediately when you said that, a part of me said, well, he deserves it probably. <laughs> Because, you know, with this long-term relationship, I love this term that my friend and colleague Terry Real termed, mm -hmm. normal marital hatred. <laughs> and is that the truth? You know, yeah. like these long-term relationships ebb and flow. I, I look at it as like, um, you know, like white, white water rafting, uh -huh. where where you can be really tumultuous and you hang on for dear life. And then eventually there's some calm mm -hmm. and then the white water starts again. So how do you hang on for dear life and stay when, you know, the crap's hitting the fan all the time? Cause like there are times where the marriage sucks and it can be like a long time. Yeah. But there's some glue to hold you together. So like, you know, 25 years is a long time. Um, how do you stay even if you want to leave? Yeah. yeah. Many times you want to yeah. leave. Yeah, right. definitely. Do you have an answer? <laughs> What's the <Yeah>. answer? <laughs> the answer is when the stuff you're getting is enough 
so you can mourn the stuff that you're not getting. Oh, I like that. That's the answer. Mm. When you're, answer. yeah. Yeah. Mm. And so what about for people that say it's not right? It's, it's abusive or it's, uh, there's, you know, lots of affairs or money stuff or addiction and all, you know, all the stuff that makes it not, right. just, not just he rolled his eyes at me, like, <laughs> right. You know, we talk about whether they want to leave or not. Yeah. Yeah. I think they could still do, even with people in those situations, they can still do their own work, like their own parts work, because they're going to need to do that for the the leaving and the separation and the divorce and you know That's eventually right. right they're going to need to do their own parts work anyways right and how can they separate you know in a way that is still connected right yeah. especially yeah. first kids but you know there may not even i just had a couple and i think and he was a very nice guy and fortunately they don't have children and I think she just felt like she didn't love him. Yeah. Yeah. And I and they decided to split up. Yeah. So it might not even be because of anything bad. Right, right. Yeah. I think marriage is this really weird thing where you're like, I don't have the friends I had twenty five years ago. Like why am I with this person? Like that I my, yeah. I sometimes think my 17 year old picked this person and now I'm stuck with him. <laughs> like what was my 17 year old thinking? Like what, you know, like that sounds terrible. I'm sorry, but that's but what a part of me thinks that. Well, of course, but, but, but fortunately or hopefully there's enough that you've grown together because yeah. you grow, right? You yeah, grow, right. sometimes you grow in very different directions, yeah. but is there something that you can do with your partner that kind of brings you into connection, you know? Mm. And that's the other thing with COVID. Like you can go on walks, which is really nice. There's more time to talk. There was now like <laughs> going back to, you know, yeah. now there's traffic again. Oh no. <laughs> right. I think you're right though because it's like I'm still I'm not 17 and he's not 17 and we've had a really cool like adventurous fun life you know so right that it's like we have grown together and changed together and um yeah I have to I have to sometimes remind my parts that he's still not that 17 year old you know what I mean like the parts of me that are that say things like that parts that only see that like parts that only see those parts of him too yes right right I really like your um, uh, whitewater rafting oh, you example. Do? I love that. Yeah, because it's so true because there's parts of whitewater rafting that is so fun and like such a great adrenaline rush. And then parts of it are actually like scary. And you're like, do they really let people on this thing? And then parts that were actually boring. Like we went last year and it, there was a part that, that like just the guy was rowing. And, and I was like, this is actually, I'm kind of bored. And that's marriage, right? Times it's boring. That's like this is marriage. right, right. Like, why am I with this person? How did I? It's like, was it David Byrne? Like, is this my beautiful house? Is this my beautiful wife? You know, it's like, what the did I do? <laughs> I love it. Where oh. am I? <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Well, and I love knowing and reminding myself, so writing, reminding yourself that it's not always that way, right? Sometimes it is. So, so that yeah. what you said, like not using the always language and then reminding yourself like the whitewater rafting thing. And then also that it's parts of me, right? Parts of me are saying that, but other parts of me are not. Like that is so helpful. That's right. That's right. And to really, the parts are helpful because it's like, you know, do you really want to go or is there other parts that don't? Do you really want to quit alcohol? Okay, but what parts don't want to? Yeah. So that, those polarities, it's so, so, so useful. 
Yeah. Right. Nope. And I love that because it's so important to talk to the parts of you that don't want to give up the alcohol. Like those are important parts too that we definitely you need to, because they're winning. <laughs> That's right. That's what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, another thing is, and this is not IFS, there's nothing that you can say that doesn't begin with the word I. The minute you start doing you do this and you're a, and you and you, it's not going to go anywhere. So well, here's the trick. You say, I feel like you're a jerk. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Right. Sorry. So, so it's like, you know, you start with what you can observe, see, hear, touch, feel, right? Okay, good. And then you say, and my interpretation is, so how are you interpreting what that person is doing, why they're doing it? And then the next one is, I feel. And then the fourth one, and this is from like my couple's work a long time ago, but it's helpful. Um, what I want generally. So what I want from you is for you to just listen to me. Or what I want from you is um, respect or what I need, the needs hierarchy, like nonviolent communication. And then the fifth thing is specifically, and you can give that to me by, and those are the five things. Okay. Say, so say them again. That was great. So, so the first one is what you observe. So Tammy, when you um, said to me, um, you can't do that. Or, yeah, my interpretation was that, um, you know, that something else happened to you and you were being bitchy to me. That was my interpretation or my story. Or like a therapist I know says, my movie, which Ooh. is also very helpful because like you've got two separate movies. Yeah. And not for one is right or wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But my movie, that's what was happening. And I felt, uh, I felt frustrated or I felt, yeah, frustrated. And what I want from you is for you not to snap at me mm. or, you know, not to take it out on me or whatever. And then specifically, you can do that by maybe taking a breath before you speak or, you know, working with your part. I love that. That's so good and so practical. I love that. I love the idea of describing it because if I have to describe it, then I'm, all, I'm not going straight to my movie, which I think is what I probably usually do, right? Like, you know, you're a jerk instead of being like, when you rolled your eyes at me, my movie or the meaning I made out of that is that you think I'm a complete idiot. And so right. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's good. I love that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's good. That's mm -hmm. really great. Well, and that would take practice and even having a conversation with your husband or, or partner or wife or, or in writing, even writing those five things down. And I think the cool thing about that is that you could even practice that in your other relationships, right? Some relationships that are a little bit easier that you could practice that way of communicating, get that, get that muscle, that communication muscle going a little bit. Right. And I like those core sentences because it keeps it lean. You know how like yeah. people go on and on and on and then it's hard for your partner to hear. Yeah. So right. you can keep it lean and you know, and that's specific, it's easier for your partner to hear. I like it. Yeah. So one other thing that I want to say is like through with long-term relationships and even in regular relationships, it's really important to notice when you're trying to change that other person and there's a lot of judgment there. And maybe to learn how to, or even contemplate this idea of embracing the suck, like <laughs> embracing the parts that you really don't like. Mm. And just realizing that's just part of that person. And, 
you know, is it so bad? Is it so evil? Like, it's not really. It's why they, it's somehow, sometimes how they survived. Mm. And really kind of like, not pushing away, but inviting in. I'm going to end with this. Be curious, not furious. Right. So when you're starting to get angry, can you just ask that part to sit next to you or, you know, breathe a little bit and then see if you can practice just a drop of curiosity about what's going on for the other person. And if you can do that, if you can get your adult online, that can stop everything. Mariska, thank you so much. This was great and so helpful. And I can't wait to listen to it again and write notes. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. And thank you for having me. Thanks for hanging out today. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe. And if you really like this episode, share it with a friend and leave a review. You can follow me on Instagram at ifstammy. And join our community on Facebook at The One Inside Podcast. Talk to you next time. Today's episode was sponsored by Brighter Vision. What's the point of having a beautiful website if it doesn't attract the clients you want to see? As the worldwide leaders of website design for therapists, Brighter Vision sees this issue happen way too often. A nice looking website doesn't equate to a successful website. The truth is, your current website might even be turning off potential clients. That's where Brighter Vision comes in. Brighter Vision's team of website designers will create a website that is centered around attracting and retaining your ideal client so that you can have a nice looking website as well as a successful one. Better yet, Brighter Vision is offering $100 off exclusively for listeners of the One Inside podcast. To take advantage of this offer, simply go to brightervision.com backslash inside. Again, that's brightervision.com backslash inside.